Hi, everyone. Thank you for making it today on this lovely Wednesday afternoon before the snow starts. So I'm looking forward to seeing. Well, I'm from Florida originally, so I'm just anticipating it any day. But um, my name is Jessica Gonzalez. I am a member of the, the Center for Racial Justice and Advocacy. I am also an assistant professor in the Counseling and Career Development Program here at CSU. And part of my research stems around multicultural competencies and whether clients view their counselors as culturally competent and whether counselors view themselves as culturally competent and how that influences the counseling process. I wanted to talk today about positionality in counseling. So how do parts of ourselves influence the counseling process? How it's defined within our field, because each field might have a different way of identifying cultural competencies, so how that's defined in our field. Some current research that I have going on, implications, and then suggestions from you, we have some experts in the room as well, about how to further advance my research, maybe based off of things that you might know or have done in the past. I wanted to start off with an example from, their name is Dr. Jessica Duray, and they did a TED Talk on challenges and rewards of culturally informed approach to mental health. So it's gonna be about a three minute clip, and it's just gonna be a little exercise to get us started. I would like to start my talk today with a little exercise, introducing you to a person named Pat is 31 years old and lives at home with one sibling and their parents. Pat has always lived in the family home and would not consider moving out to live alone, except after getting married. Pat's parents always play a significant role in making decisions about all aspects of Pat's life, including education, work decisions, Pat's friendships, and romantic life. This has been the case since Pat was a child. Pat rarely makes decisions without consulting family members and rarely expresses disagreement with others out of fear of disapproval or loss of support. Pat feels very uncomfortable when alone and tends to cling to others out of fear of being abandoned. Now take a moment to picture Pat. Are you picturing a young man? A young woman? Are you picturing a person of a particular ethnic or cultural background, maybe similar to your own, or different? And consider for a moment whether such information would make a difference in how you think about Pat, and whether or not you think that Pat might have some kind of mental health concern. Now what if I added the following information, specifying that Pat is Patricia Lee, and that she and her family immigrated to Canada from China when she was five years old. Or the following, where Pat is Patrick Smith, whose maternal and paternal grandparents immigrated to Canada from the United Kingdom, and whose parents grew up in the Toronto area. Judging from some faces that I can see, this information indeed makes a difference in how you think about Pat. Simply adding some basic demographic information can significantly shift how we think about the very same behaviors. This exercise has elicited similar responses in my classroom when I have used it in teaching about personality disorders, which offer a particularly striking example of the need to consider cultural factors when defining mental illness, since they are themselves defined by patterns of behavior that deviate from cultural expectations. I use this exercise to introduce the role of cultural factors in thinking about mental health and illness and to introduce the central idea that culture matters. I like that example of Pat because it highlights how we sometimes have these preconceived notions of just hearing of an individual's story and how the first impression of someone might lead to you thinking of some stereotypes. However, when you throw in some demographic variables, such as their culture, how they identify 
with their gender, how they identify their sexual orientation, that adds more layers to that core of that onion. So it's important to take into account the client's full story and not just when they first come into counseling. Uh, one example that I have of a client is they first came in into my office and they were sharing how they've recently lost their mother and how their current dog reminded them of their mother and they actually thought that th that dog could be their mother. So when you first hear that, that sounds where, where is that coming from? It doesn't sound like an everyday conversation that someone might have or tell you. However, with asking more questions about this person's beliefs, where is this belief coming from? So this person actually identified as Buddhist, and Buddhists believe in reincarnation and in rebirth. So essentially, they believe that one person, once they pass away, they can be reincarnated into something else. That's including animals. So when first hearing that, I'm thinking, hmm, is this person, are they having a delusion? What, what's going on with that? They think that this, per, that this dog can be their mother. However, uncovering more and asking, well, where is this belief coming from? It doesn't seem as abnormal. So uh, that's the cultural norm and their belief. So it's important to continue to uncover that as this Pat example and as this client that came in um, talking about their grieving mother to uh, keep unpacking that. Within the counseling field, we have certain competencies that help us develop cultural competence and relate with clients from diverse backgrounds. Now, this is called multicultural and social justice counseling competencies, and these are the most recent ones which built upon multicultural counseling, just the competencies. So this provides a framework for counselors and researchers within the counseling field to frame their research and practice um, when working with clients from different backgrounds. This is very hard work, so I just want to start with putting that out there, that this is constantly becoming self-aware of yourself, self-aware of the client's worldview, and it's not something that you practice overnight, especially when dealing with clients that you haven't dealt with before. So for example, I haven't worked with a lot of persons with disabilities before. So if I have a person come in that wants some help with that, I would need to gain more knowledge in that area. So even though I've been, I'm a, been a practicing counselor now for six years, um, that's an area that I would need to seek out more information about. So something I might do that I have done actually is when I attend a conference, I attend a presentation on persons with disabilities and how they um, some of their needs, some, some of the needs that they might have. This is a model from the Multicultural and Social Justice Competencies by Rats and Colleagues from 2015. And this essentially shows how different positionalities can influence the, the counseling relationship. I've actually printed out, because some of you might have trouble seeing this, there's a couple copies, if you want to share with each other, of this figure. And what it essentially says is that, depending on what kind of client you have, you might be in a privileged position or you might be in a marginalized position, and that your positions are constantly changing. So for example, I identify as a Latina female. If I have a client, who is a white male that comes in, in that situation, I would be considered a marginalized client and the counselor would be privileged. However, it doesn't really stop there because for example, if the client does not have a high school degree, I have a graduate degree, now I become privileged in my education area. So the hats are constantly changing and being aware of how those dynamics influence the counseling relationship is what this model is saying of you can be one minute, I, one hour, I could be a marginalized counselor, and the next, I could be the privileged counselor. So constantly being aware of how that hat changes as each client comes in is something that I actually need to take, take some time and, okay, this client's coming in, who is this person? It's like, which role do I have right now? Some of the ways, so th these competencies are constantly being developed. And these are four ways that the model illustrates that you can develop this. So that's through counselor self-awareness, client worldview, 
the counseling relationship and counseling and advocacy interventions. As I mentioned before, the counselor self-awareness, so if you see here, it kind of opens up into the things that you need to do, is constantly working on yourself, with example, with the persons with disabilities that I mentioned, I need to gain more knowledge on that. The client worldview, just because a person comes from, for example, I'm Cuban American, so if I have another Cuban person that comes into the room, not just assuming that we share the same views, how does that client view their world um, and their position in the field. The main thing that the research says is that you can't do any interventions, no matter how much I know about Cuban people, unless the counseling relationship is there. So I could be practicing for 30 years, and if, I, if a client walks in and I come off as standoffish and kind of just sit there closed, they're not gonna wanna listen to anything, no matter if I'm a Latina and they're a Latina female as well. So working on that. And then counseling and advocacy interventions. This is something that's different from the in the 90s that's added now of you need the skills, knowledge, and awareness, and then you need to take some action is another thing that this model is emphasizing. A little bit about myself is that I'm a counselor educator. So this is what I have my, my PhD in. So this is, I teach other counselors who want to become counselors how to treat clients. I'm also a clinical administrator. So I help um, organize the, when our students see clients here, like getting them clients, getting them ready for practicum. I'm also a teacher and a supervisor. So I supervise students who are gonna be seeing clients. I also am, provide professional service, such as I'm providing this presentation that's for free, so you don't have to pay. I'll pass it on a collection plate, but that's not. <laughs> can put whatever you want in there. Um, I've also been past president of the Florida Association for Multicultural Counseling and Development, so that's another hat that I wear, and a researcher and a scholar. So this is kind of my professional world, and these is also, I have different positionalities in different areas as well. One of the areas that I research is, like I mentioned, counseling competencies in counseling, as well as people with medical illnesses, such as breast cancer, how to provide the most effective treatment and counseling for them. There's more hats that I wear, which you'll start noticing that you might have different roles in your life professionally and outside of life. So I am Cuban American and I was born in Miami, Florida, actually. So my parents are Cuban. I was first generation, my sister and I born in Florida. So I grew up in an area where I guess in this world, I would cons be considered a minority population, but I grew up being a majority. So what I mean by that is that I even had, my K through 12 teachers were all Latina females. So I grew up with strong figures, even growing up in the United States. So now moving to Colorado, now I'm starting to assimilate in a different way over here with now realizing things I hadn't realized before. Um, these are, also fact these are all factors that affect my positionality and privilege in the counseling. So I also grew up in a, in a middle class family. So I have to take this into consideration when someone comes in and they might have um, a low socioeconomic status. Acknowledge that I had different privileges than they had, including education. Also, I'm a spiritual person. Um, that is something that I take into account, I grew up Catholic, I went to Catholic school. I don't identify as that right now, but I need to put that in the forefront as someone who does identify as Catholic. Okay, what are the differences between that and my, my beliefs and theirs right now? I also have a graduate degree, which to some people it might be intimidating. So for example, with certain clients, I just kind of say, call me Jessica, because the Dr. Jessica sometimes creates a boundary between people thinking that I'm the expert and they're not, so I, like to create that collaborative relationship, especially in counseling. Now in the classroom when I teach, I like to go by Dr. G because it establishes a certain authority but still collaborative process. I'm also a cisgendered person. So that affects my positionality in counseling as well. All of these, that's why there's a little circle here that it's exhausting to be aware of all of these things. It's exhausting to be aware of the other slide of my professionalism. It's exhausting to be aware of all of this with each client. However, it helps me become, become a better counselor.
So now this just highlights some of my research and the research that I'm going to be talking about. What is critical to realize is the way in which our universities have divided up the sciences does not reflect the way in which nature has divided up its problems. That affects my research and my research lens of needing to have a more inclusive um, perspective on things because people are complicated and research is complicated. So it's not just that each person who has a chronic mental illness has the same kind of treatment. So these are the things that I like to research um, and provide the best kind of care for people. So these are just some personal examples that I have used personally to help me build multicultural competence and I'm never going to be done with it so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, asking clients for their preferences. How do you prefer for me to refer to you as? What gender pronoun would you like to be referred to as? How do you identify um, you're Cuban, but do you identify as Cuban American? Where are you with that? Immersion in different cultures. Let's just pick up from Miami, Florida and move to Fort Collins, for example. That's one example. Let's just immerse yourself in, in something. Um, conducting research. So I've conducted research with Latina breast cancer survivors. And some things that have come out of that, for example, has been how to build a relationship with an, when you have a counselor who speaks English, yet the person that you're providing care, their native language is Spanish, yet they understand English. So some research that has come out of that is a way to build a relationship is also being sensitive to people's languages. So some, some things that I've uncovered in the research is that even using words like family translated into Spanish means familismo. So using that even as an English speaking person can help build a relationship with that person because it shows that you are putting some investment into that relationship with someone. Another thing with Lat the, specifically the Latina breast cancer survivors is spirituality. A lot of them had identified as Catholic. So espiritismo is another word that you can just use. So it's not hooked on phonics for Spanish, but this is something that you can just use to try and build that relationship. Um, so now I have a little exercise that I wanted you to just think about. Imagine for yourself that you walk into a counselor's office. So you have a certain problem, you're going to counseling. What does this person look like to you? How does their voice sound? How would you want this person to greet you? What does their office look like? What would they need to ask you for you to feel comfortable in the counseling session? Another aspect of counseling that is privileged is that clients tell us things that they might not have told anybody before. So that's another privilege of the counseling relationship would need to be there. Now, if I asked each one of you what your answers would be to this, you'd probably have some similarities, yet some very different answers of what you would want your counselor to look like, how, what would their office need to look like, some people would want someone that looks exactly like them. Some people would want the opposite of that. Some people would want a counseling office outside, like I would rather be outside than inside. Um, so it's very different depending on, every, um, on your situations. So this is what the research says. Clients may, be, may prefer to have a counselor that looks like them, however, there's not, there hasn't been a consistent connection between whether having someone who looks similar to you influences the client outcomes. So what that means is that if I have another person who identifies as Latina and Cuban American, that doesn't necessarily mean that my depression is gonna get better or that my anxiety is going to reduce. There hasn't been consistent research to make that correlation. 
There's also a lot of differences between what clients think is important in a relationship and what counselors think is important in a counseling relationship. And believe it or not, we, um, counseling is very client focused. However, there's very limited research on the client's perspective. I can, I can ask all my students, do you think you're multicultural competent? They're like, yes, 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 yes. Okay, but does the client think that? Because that's more important than what the students think. Um, all these professors, I was just at a conference in Chicago, we're all very, we're good at these, we're good at this. But does the client think we're good at this? Does the student think that I'm good at teaching the multicultural competence? So that's something that I am currently researching. I'm Before I talk about that research study, I wanted to hear a little bit from um, you in the audience of what does the research say in your field about cultural competence? Have you found that it's influenced any outcomes? Like if a teacher is culturally competent, is that influence the student's school performance? Yeah. So in K-12 education, uh -huh. the, the, the research is mixed about that. Okay. There's some studies that indicate that having a teacher that is aligned in gender and or race and ethnicity mm -hmm. does Some Great. So it seems similar to the research and counseling, too, that it's a little bit mixed. Yeah. 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 DL. Being able to build those relationships mm -hmm. Thank you for adding that. Um, so I'm hearing too that in, in these fields, K through 12, higher ed also, like that aspect of the relationship is very important. Someone could be very culturally competent and not have the social skills to build those relationships. So within the counseling field, it has been shown that people of similarities can build a strong relationship, yet there hasn't been enough research to show whether that then, like for example, decreases the depression or improves the anxiety. So that's kind of, um, it, it does help with the relationship and then what else does it help with? Does it help? So that was, that's um, the prompt of my current research, which was actually 
my long and tedious dissertation, so I'm getting as much out of this as I can. Um, so this, the study was called Counselor, Counselor's Multicultural Competence and the Working Alliance as Predictors of Client Outcome. And I measured this quantita quantitatively. So it was with giving each client and counselor surveys. And I'm going to talk about what that looks like and go over some of the definitions of, so that we can be on the same page. Essentially, the study was conducted in a clinic with clients and students in practicum. What that means is students who are getting their master's degree in counseling that are seeing clients in our, um, our clinic. And I had 119 clients and 72 counselors. So it was actually a pretty nice sample size. And what I did is I gave clients and counselors the same assessments. So multicultural competence, the counselor rated themselves on their cultural competence. I have some example of what was asked on that particular assessment. For example, it says, I am aware of my own cultural heritage. I am aware I have, of how my own values might affect this client. I understand the current socio-political systems and its impact on the client. So that's an example of three questions that the counselor was asked. And they were asked to do this from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then an example of what the, counselor, what the client filled out was, my counselor values and respects cultural, cultural differences. My counselor is comfortable with differences between myself and them. My counselor demonstrates knowledge about my culture. And then they also had to survey that on strongly disagree to strongly agree. The working alliance, so then I was talking about that's, all, that's just the therapeutic relationship. So I had client and counselors fill out their perspectives on that as well. And then the client filled out their symptomatology, first session and third session. And I used that to see whether the client's interpersonal relationship, quality of life, and distress improved in the counseling session. I also looked at social desirability. So sometimes when a client is filling out something on the counselor, they might answer in a way that they want the client, the counselor to like them, or vice versa. The, count, the client might answer in a way that they want the counselor to like them. So I use that as a mediator to look at whether they were doing that or not. And I'll give you a second to read. These were my two main research questions. Essentially, what this is asking is that does client and counselor's perspective, so if I rate, the count, if I rate my counselor high on cultural competency and if the, relationship, if the counseling relationship is good, does that make the client better? The same thing with the counselor. If I rate myself, if I think I have high multicultural competence and I think that the relationship is good, does that help the client get better? Those were the things that I was looking at. This is some, I used hierarchical regression and linear modeling, which I'm just going to, these are the results, and I'll just explain what that means. Essentially, the only thing that was significant with client outcomes was the counselor's perception of their multicultural competence. So if the counselor rated them, themselves high on multicultural competence, that influenced the client's distress and interpersonal relationships. So it helped the client. If the counselor thought that they were multiculturally competent, it helped the client's um, distress. Granted, this was very minimal, so it was only like 1.5%. So if you look at 100% of the counseling relationship on what helps the client get better, the counselor's perspective on the multicultural competence was only 1.5% of that 100%. But that just adds to the literature because we don't know what that 100% is. There's so many other factors that can help influence the relationship. There were also differences, which was consistent with the literature, on how client and counselors viewed the counselor's multicultural competence and the therapeutic relationship. And one of the most interesting findings is that the client rated the counselors higher. 
So I'm a counselor and Louise is my client. And we both rate my multicultural competence. I rated myself at 50, she rated me at 60. So she thought I was better than what I thought I was. The same thing with the relationship. I rated it as 50, Louise rated it as 60. So she thought the relationship was better than what I thought it was. So that gives some insight as to they both thought generally that the counselor was competent and that the relationship was good, but the client thought that it was better, that both of those things were better. Now, some limitations on that is that there is not a scale that is specifically for clients. So I had to adapt and make a scale that's called like the cross-cultural counseling inventory revised that was for clients. So it came out normal, like the reliability was normal. However, there's not a scale out right now that measures counselors' view of multicultural competence. So even the scale that was used was based off of like what a student would be filling out. So that begs the question, did, did the client understand the language on that scale? Do they define cultural competency different? Do they define the working alliance differently, the therapeutic relationship? I also just rated this first and third session, and a lot of that clients were filling out assessments. So they probably only realistically had two hours together. So looking forward, I would want to look at what about if someone meets for 16 times or over the course of four or five months? Is that different? So a big question in our field right now is does multicultural competency matter? Should we infuse it? It's emphasized to infuse on our entire curriculum. It used to be just one course that counselors had. You had like multicultural counseling. But now it's supposed to be infused in all of our courses, as I think it should. So this does show that the counselor's perspective does matter of what they think about themselves in helping the client get better. So that was, the only, that was the, one of the findings that was significant. Um, so when I look at what I help my students do is looking at their own cultural competency. Do they think they're multiculturally competent? How can we help that? What is the discrepancy between the client and the counselor? So I would even use these assessments as just a conversational piece with clients and counselors. What's different? What's the same? If the client thinks that the counselor does not respect my culture, they put strongly disagree, they can use that as a point of discussion with the client. And then the other thing, because clients and counselors both thought that the relationship was different because they rated it differently, asking the client, how is it going between us? What can I do to help you feel more comfortable? At different points in the session, like first session, fifth session, and the last session, and continuing to work on that together. Um, so some next steps that I want to take is a qualitative perspective, which is like actually possibly forming an, a survey just for clients. So asking clients what do they think what multicultural competence is. Is it important to them? So opening that up a lot more, because this helped highlight that there were differences, but I don't know where those differences are. So I want to ask them about that. Um, and then just increasing data collection points. Like I said, I did first and third session, but a lot happens between first. I've been in counseling myself for about two years now, and I'm, I express things very differently than I did in the first, third session than what I do now with clients. And then that are my implications. And if you had any other questions or suggestions, I am free to take those now. Uh -huh. where um, I was with a group of, I mean, it's 
not a counseling setting whatsoever. Sure. But I was with a community organization. We were at a state house advocating around redistricting, and it was a multiracial group of folks. And these state senators were like, "Oh, hello, hello, hello." They got to me, and he goes, "Me how?" Oh, that was <laughs> an assumption. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I was like, I and and you know the whole group. I remember afterwards we were all like, "Was he trying to be culturally competent?" Or you know, because I they could everyone could see kind of like I was shocked and mm-hmm. I was just like, "Oh my gosh." And then he goes, oh, and then the follow-up to that was the state senator goes, oh, was that the wrong language, konnichiwa? Oh. And I was like, uh-huh. uh, no, hello will be fine. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like, oh, it was just like such an awkward experience. So then sure. I was like, well, I, and after, like I said, afterwards we were all talking about it and we were like, I guess he was trying to be culturally mm-hmm. competent, but then there were a couple of, uh, Latinx members in our group too, but he didn't say hola to them. And, mm-hmm. You know, so and if he had, how would we have responded to that as well? And, and I don't, it just, it feels, I'm, 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 I guess I'm just trying to, I'd like to hear more about how, like, the context um, would matter and at what point would people just, you know, use words? When is it? Sure. I think that's a, not? yeah, that's a great question and highlight. So, for example, that's something, that's an article that I wrote, right? So let's say someone just reads that is working with Latina breast cancer survivors and they're like, oh, I should use familismo and I should use espiritismo with this person. But then that Latina breast cancer survivor does not really understand Spanish or doesn't speak Spanish that well. So then now you've impaired their relationship at some level a little bit because you're just assuming that this person would understand that. And then I can even speak from my own experience. So. I speak Spanish, but not as well as I would like to. So if a counselor just assumed and came in and started speaking to me fast Spanish, I would feel a little bit insecure because then they expect me to respond in that way. So in a way, I feel insecure. So then it takes me a little bit while to rebuild that relationship. So not just assuming, sorry, not just that takes the knowledge and the skill part that that model shows of privileged, marginalized client that you read this article or this person might have read ways to greet, I don't know what you want to put, constituents from different cultures. And they're like, use konnichiwa, use familismo, but then not checking in with the person. How easy would that have been to just say, What's, what language do you speak, or, rather than just going into it? So it can harm the counseling relationship as well. Yeah. I guess the way I was hearing that is I was assuming that the counselor wasn't just going to sort of start out with that. Mm-hmm. But I know, for example, my partner is from Brazil, and there's a Portuguese word, um, saudade, which is like, mm-hmm. I miss you. But it's like more than I miss you. And there's no other word that can really replace it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, in, in my relationship with him, to use that word instead of saying, I miss you, but saudade, it, it helps to convey and relate to him more deeply. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I was imagining in this case in that counselor-client relationship that Mm -hmm. that that shows you're really being attentive to and saying, oh, you know, does familismo mean something different to you and family in English? That, That does make sense. And I think what I'm trying to convey, too, is that that's one of the differences with multicultural competence of just having the knowledge of a word and then having the skill to ask that question and not just using it. So there's certain, it all goes together and it's all developed, especially in beginning counselors. If your supervisor is not talking about using language and they just read this, they might not have the skill to then, how do I ask this question? So there, there's multiple layers to that. What was your demographic like as the clients of the counselors? Oh, that's great. Um, it was mostly white population and then Latino and then they identified, so they self-identified so it was um, Latino um, and then African-American population for the clients. And then the counselors were mostly white female. Mm-hmm. Do you have in that information um, any information about the modality of therapy being practiced or were they all practicing the same modality of therapy? I don't have that information. And I think that that's worthy of collecting as well, of how the how the counselor identifies their theoretical orientation. I don't have that information, but probably in my next one now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The 
said that part of the study was looking at whether or not it changed outcomes. So mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm wondering, is that, I, is there any particular modality that that, that like outcomes of success really is? Well, because I'm, I'm wondering, is it a fair question, you know, in some ways, right? Or do, or do we expect a different outcome because of multicultural, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you look like you want to say something. Well, yeah. I'm just, I'm uh -huh. just a major, so I think uh -huh. I over this a lot. And yeah. There isn't really any one, like, style of therapy that mm -hmm. is, like, way better than the other. But just depending on, like, the specific, you know, symptoms or disorder being treated, that there are some things that, like, would work better for, um, I would echo that. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Yeah, because it, mm -hmm. I think I, I think then is there a way? And I think you said it's still mixed, but there is something mm -hmm. that you know in the, in the research question. Then the question may be about the the efficacy of the relationship more than the efficacy of the outcome, right? It, so the results indicated that, which was different than what the research says. So the research says that the counseling, if a, you have a strong therapeutic relationship, then the client outcome is better. Mine didn't show that the relationship had a significant predictor of client outcome. And I think one of those reasons are is that it was only three sessions and it wasn't, it might not have been long enough to develop that therapeutic relationship. So that was, that's different than the literature. And even definitions of multicultural competency were Well, it was based off of the survey that was given to them. So then, yeah, it was about 16. I just gave some examples, yeah. But it was, that was based off of this model that I showed of knowledge, skills, and awareness minus the social justice perspective because it was based off of the first model. Mm -hmm. So what would you say the social justice perspective adds to the multicultural competency? I can give a concrete example. Um, in Florida, I would work with Latino populations and I would have appointments with them working in a community agency and they weren't able to have transportation to make it to the sessions that I had. So then it forced me, at that time I was very involved with the Florida Counseling Association, to do like a letter writing campaign to um, the current governor and just highlight the underutilization of Latinos and why that might be in that certain area. So that social justice perspective then in turn, I got a response, but I don't know if it really helped. But you know, I acknowledge that this is a problem where you're going to work on it kind of thing. But it made, it let the client feel that I was advocating for them and then it also helped me feel like I was advocating for my client. So going beyond the, the client counselor relationship to the larger system? Yes, to the larger system, and then I would also say through research and interventions. So for example, um, even in Fort Collins at Pathways, this past summer, I did a mindfulness group with caregivers. And I just advertised for caregivers to come in and receive this mindfulness. The population ended up primarily white um, women that came. That wasn't targeting a specific population. But now, um, working in Greeley, they are gonna open up a new Pathways, and they're saying that they need some Spanish interventions there, so I want to advocate for that and help, I can't translate that, I don't speak that well, but help translate that intervention and offer it there. So it's advocating also through, my main source of advocating right now is through the interventions I want to offer to the more underserved populations. So that's where that social justice goes. It becomes systemically transformative. Right. That's a great way to put it, yeah. yeah. Systematically transformative. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.